All right, welcome back. Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 7. And it's in this lecture where we migrate, finally, from things client-side to things server-side. And this is the environment in which we'll continue to play for the remainder of the semester with projects and lectures alike. Topics am among the topics tonight are HTTP, Java Server Pages, aka JSPs, and Java Servlet. What I thought I would do tonight is sort of flip things around from the usual approach and dive right into project three, since it will serve as a nice discussion point for our focus tonight on all things server side. So in your project three directory, once you download it from the course's website or from NICE itself, you will get a setup like this, a couple of whose directories should be similar in structure to what you saw for project one. So to be clear, starting with project three, we're going to return to the world of Java, which where will largely remain, at least for the assigned projects in the course. You have a build file, you have now a configuration directory, you again have a source directory, a temp directory, and a web apps directory, and this ultimately is going to be the framework for our first server-side application, namely Wahoo. The first thing I, and ultimately you, are going to do when downloading the code is to go into this conf directory, which has three files, one of which is called server.xml. And rest assured that in the project spec, your hand is held through all of these steps as well. So tonight's meant to be a cursory overview of the same. So this essentially is the configuration file, one of them for an application known as Tomcat. Tomcat is an application server, aka a J2EE container. Uh, it's also a web server. So what we're going to be using it for is to, one, host some static content, though not a huge amount. But ultimately, we're going to be using it as our um, application server for everything related to JSPs and XSLT and tracks and Java servlets as well. So if you're familiar with Apache, Think of this as Apache, but with the additional feature that it understands JSPs and Java servlets. That is, it's a J2EE container. Um, this is a fairly simplified configuration file. What I tried hard to do in putting this project together with the latest version of all of these tools is to take actual uh, Tomcat configuration files that come with the distribution. So when you download it yourself in the future for your own work, you'll actually see files very similar to these. And what I tried to do was simplify them for our purposes and really rip out anything that might be a distraction or really be overwhelming. So what you have here, in effect, is a pretty minimal configuration that gets the job done, but is certainly representative of a configuration you could actually use in a real world environment. So just as Apache, though free, is sort of an industry standard, similarly is Tomcat quite popular and quite uh, well performing these days. So it's certainly a viable choice, certainly when you compare it alongside some of the commercial tools that exist, which I'll enumerate later tonight just so you're exposed to it. So most of this, to be honest, you can ignore, certainly on first glance, but the only important thing you need to do in step one is to fill in these values for port. And I specifically left them blank so that we don't all try to use the same port, and we'll discuss ports briefly tonight, but essentially you want to choose some unique values here uh, between 65,000 and um, between 1,000 and 65,000, essentially. But the directions are atop this file. I'm just going to sort of arbitrarily choose 8,005 there. And then down here, I'm going to choose 8080. And know now that if you ever try to run Tomcat or Project 3 or Project 4 at the command line and you get some kind of error about port in use, it's just because by coincidence, you've chosen the same number as someone else. No big deal. Just go back and change it to something else that's pseudo-random. Uh, they should be different ports. We're ultimately only going to use the 8080 one, the one that's here in the connector element. The other one is used for really remote controlling the server, shutting it down, starting it up. Um, but they should be different because they induce different behaviors. OK, so that's all. I saved. What I'm gonna now going to do is run ant, as you were familiarized with, with project one. This is going to go through all that source tree and compile all of the related files. You get sort of a visual teaser here of the code we're going to be playing with, a login module, prefs for preferences, users, view, Wahoo servlet, all of which we'll tease apart tonight and in section if you'd like. Uh, once I've done that, I am simply going to run the command tomcat, which realize is an alias on nice for a program, a shell script called Catalina.sh, which comes with the Tomcat distribution. And there's a PC equivalent called Catalina.bat. And the project spec walks you through this as well. I just alias it to Tomcat, because that way we have sort of a faster way of getting uh, running the script. So I'm going to run Tomcat. 
This output will very soon be familiar to you because you'll be seeing it a lot when you spawn the server, but effectively what I just did was I launched my web server and with it my application server so that literally running on one of these nice.fas machines now is my own instance of a web server. So realize the distinction. If I go to www.fas.harvard.edu and hit enter, I'm going to get FAS's, Harvard's main web server instance. But because I configured this file, server.xml, with my own port number that was higher than the standard ports of you know, 0 through 1024, what this means is that if you specifically visit the web server's 8080 port, you're not going to get Harvard's web server, you're going to get mine, literally running out of my own account. The only thing that's important to note though is what machine you're on. So thus far we've been glossing over the fact that nice.fas is not actually a machine. It's a DNS name for a cluster of machines which you may have realized are actually called ice1. Dot .fas and ice2.fas. Really doesn't matter which one you SSH to, which is why we just tell you to SSH to nice and you're sort of round robin fashion assigned to one of these boxes. You can SSH directly to them by just doing SSH ice1.fas.harvard.edu, which you might find useful if nothing else. But for now, just take note that I am on ice3. And the spec tells you another way to figure this out, but this is why in the very first class we had you configure your account with our little script so that it would have some standard layout, not only your username, but the host name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to http colon slash slash ice3.fas.harvard.edu colon 8080. And when I go ahead and hit enter here, what I'm going to see is my instance of a web server and this is effectively the home page of what will be your Wahoo portal. So we've provided you with a framework for this portal, uh, namely the login module. So obviously when you just visit the base directory of your um, of your application server, notice that the URL changed to slash servlet slash login and the spec explains how we did that. But this is effectively your default login screen like you might have for a typical e-commerce like site. So notice that if I want to try logging in here, I could try mail in with password. I'm going to go ahead and log in. Well, no, never. Okay, invalid username and password, so there's clearly some kind of checking going on. Turns out that I can log in with a pre-existing account, jharvard password crimson, and the spec reminds you of that too. I can go ahead and log in, but unfortunately that's where the demo ends. There's really nothing more there. So among the frameworks we've provided you with, we pretty much implemented the login module for you in a way that's simple. It uses an XML flat file, so we don't need to actually have a back-end database per se. We'll just store things in XML files for simplicity and to acclimate ourselves further to the use of them anyway. But once you get to this big white screen, this is going to be sort of your canvas to paint. And as the name portal suggests, and as the spec elaborates, the idea of Wahoo is ultimately to implement your own portal of sorts. So the spec is going to walk you through the process of pulling news feeds from a site called moreover.com. Um, these are free news feeds in all sorts of categories. You, most, if not all of you, are probably familiar with RSS already. RSS is sort of all the rage and increasingly popular these days. RSS is just a fancy way of saying it's an XML file, but it's in a standard format a format that typically includes titles and dates and URLs, and RSS is increasingly used to syndicate news, the latest Engadget or Slashdot articles, the latest New York Times headlines. Well, moreover, provides an RSS feed exactly like that, and they also provide a couple other formats, um, one of which is a, a, a more detailed XML file that provides more information than a typical RSS feed uses. So we're going to be using that particular feed, but the lessons learned in the, this particular project will apply perfectly to any interest you might have in RSS. And you can certainly download free RSS readers today, but the fact of the matter is, with just a couple lines of code, you soon will be able to implement your own RSS reader of some sort. And that's effectively what we're going to be doing here. So on this canvas, ultimately, will presumably be links to today's headlines in various categories. There's going to be a link to a preferences module, whereby you're going to allow a user to subscribe to feeds of interest in all the available categories. And then the project also challenges you with adding a sort of personal touch as you see fit, which might very well include including additional feeds like movies that are coming up or reviews or uh, stock tickers or the latest uh, headlines from any RSS based feed. Really you're going to get your hands dirty with a very, very common use of XML today, namely the distribution of data in the forms of these feeds. And that will be ultimately a work of art, we hope. And then the spec walks you through sort of the expectations, but really this is meant to be a fun project, as were the others, but hopefully more fun in that 
it's actually an application. And it's not just something you're running in a folder or a command line on your own machine. It's going to be out there. And you can certainly port this to any web server that supports J2EE hereafter. So that's the teaser. We'll probably conclude tonight with a bit more detail on the framework and such, but that's sort of where we're going. And what, we're, what we'll do in project four is sort of continue along these lines of doing things on the server side and actually integrate the notion of a, a shopping cart and product fulfillment and using web services. So really going another big step toward very popular types of applications today, all using these, uh, the ideas that we've been weaving throughout the course. So with that said, any questions of any sort before we forge ahead. No? All right. So last time, you had a guest lecture, me, from 12 months ago. Um, I apologize for not being here in person. I was away for much of the week. But hopefully, you learned from that guy a bit about namespaces and a bit about SVG and XSLFO. I would say by far, at least if you're like me, the one that should have or may have scared you the most was XSLFO because frankly it's sort of a scary language and we really just scratched the surface of it. Fortunately, there do exist some basic building blocks within it that really do let you just get the job done when it comes to generating PDFs, purchase orders as you'll do in Project 4, um, but hopefully you at least got some familiarity with that and hopefully had some fun in particular with SVG, which again, per I think a listserv post of mine, isn't so much being used to render things in browsers as you were probably doing during development, but sort of as an intermediate format using um, some of the tools we alluded to in the project or on the website for converting these things to PDFs or JPEGs, GIFs, whatever. All of that can be done via very easily uh, deployed tools. And namespaces, you know, this isn't so much a, an interesting topic in and of itself, but based on the number of emails on the listserv, it's certainly sort of a potential source of confusion. So at least sort of understanding some of those basic ideas of what namespaces are and why they're useful and what a namespace node is will hopefully let you answer increasingly more questions like why am I getting XML NS equals quote unquote in my output. And a few emails in particular went across the listserv there. So if you're still fuzzy on that or you're still getting that output, it's not good output. So simply um, speak up when the, when the questions arise as to how to get rid of that. But that's what really that was meant to do. And you're going to see namespaces throughout everything XML related. And the more XML stuff we introduce in the course, the more you're going to see new namespaces. And frankly, if you can remember the unique URIs that represent these namespaces, Great job. Um, don't fear copying and pasting, though. For the most part, that's what folks do. OK, this time. So tonight is meant to do a few things. One, sort of level the playing field. If there are a few of you in the course who've come in with really no sort of server-side website development, we're not going to focus so much on the, the boring details like what's HTML again and how do you implement a form, because those details we certainly assume. And certainly, if you've never implemented an HTML form before, it's something you can pick up over the course of an hour or two later this evening or certainly on your own. So we'll assume certainly that students are savvy or at least comfortable with the basics of HTML because we're going to be using that a lot for things that we do server side. But tonight we'll try to take a peek under the hood at some of HTTP's features as they relate to J2EE and how this lets us use things like cookies which will let us implement shopping carts and sessions, as they're called, more generally. And a lot of these ideas um, will actually apply not only to our Java XML world here, but CGI, uh, ASP, um, PHP, all of those server-side environments support these same features. Different syntax, usually, but certainly the same idea. So all of this content will be portable in that sense. We'll take a look at sort of a uh, general approach to J2EE, what it means to implement a an enterprise architecture, that sort of thing, which we're ultimately doing, albeit in sort of a sandbox form. But what we certainly try to do with these projects is give you not only code that's laid out in sort of a standard way that you'll see again after the course, but also try to implement within the course you know, projects that are representative of projects that you might actually um, dive into outside of the course as well. And we'll do this tonight by way of JSPs, servlets, and specifically via project three. So with that said, this is something you've typed and said many, many times, but in a sentence or two. What is HTTP? Hypertext? Transfer. Transfer protocol. Sure. OK. What's that mean? Protocol meaning over TCP usually, I guess. Okay. Um, where you can ask for things or, or post, get or post. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay, so to recap, summarize, it's a, a protocol, which means it's effectively a language. As this picture implies, it's spoken typically between web servers and web browsers, although that need not be the case necessarily. Uh, it involves the idea of getting or posting information. So anytime you submit a query to Google, you're posting or getting information back from Google. Anything you do with forms on the internet uses one of these protocols um, 99 times out of 100. Um, it's a layer five protocol, which means it runs on top of things, specifically TCP, usually. And what does that mean, though, in more real terms? Well, this is just the language sort of that web browsers and web servers speak to one another. And you, the developer, certainly when it comes to developing actual applications on top of HTTP, don't really need to know any of these details or worry about the particular implementation because you get these layers of abstraction by way of APIs. And Java servlets are going to give us an abstraction to what it means to use HTTP. But in that, it's a transfer protocol. It allows us to do things ultimately like maintain state. I mean, HTTP itself is a stateless protocol, which means each request that goes across the wire uh, can or is usually just an independent request that doesn't know about the previous request and doesn't know what you're going to request next. But by way of mechanisms that have been built on top of it, like cookies, can you actually maintain sort of the illusion of a persistent connection with a web server, even though as soon as you download today's news, that web server has forgotten about you or would seem to have forgotten about you because your socket connection has closed. But fortunately, there exist mechanisms both in browsers and web servers today that allow both parties to remember a little something about the other guy so that when they next talk, they know that it's the same person having that conversation. So what does this mean, or what are some of the, the salient um, points to bear in mind? So what's a TCP port? So yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of a port of entry, to you know, borrow the, the word, into the server. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you've got a, a server sitting somewhere, you could call that a web server. You could call it an email server. Back in the day, it could be a gopher server. It could be doing any number of things all of them operating on the same piece of hardware, all of them sharing the same IP address. So in short, what, HTTP, what TCP ports allow a server to do is to distinguish the different services that might be running on the same physical box, on the same physical uh, internet connection using the same actual IP address. So in effect, whenever you make a request from your browser or from AOL Instant Messenger or from Outlook to some remote server, not only are you contacting its IP address or its host name, but you're also specifying what port you want to talk to. And the default port that a web browser would use to talk to a web server, as you may know, is 80. So 80, burn that into your memory if you've never heard it before. That is the default port that the world has sort of decided means a web server is running on that server if it's listening on port 80. Uh, just for a little trivia, SSH, by contrast, is 22. Uh, SMTP for mail, 25. Uh, SSL, which is used by HTTP, 443. And we'll def leave all the others to real trivia nights. But those are the kinds of numbers, at least, that you've probably seen. But at least starting tonight, you should at least have a sense of why they exist and what they're useful for. So it should now sort of follow logically that if the world has sort of allocated these numbers for standardized uses, this is a problem for you, the developer. If you're just a little guy on Harvard server that wants to run his own web server, well, that's why pretty much you can use any, some exceptions, any of the numbers from 1025 up to roughly 65,000. And that's why I sort of arbitrarily chose 8080. It just turns out 8080 is a very commonly chosen large number in that range. But you can choose any four-digit value or five-digit value in the range specified. And all that means is that you can run any of thousands of different services, in theory, resources permitting on the same box. So when you're actually running your own version of Wahoo, you are running your own website either on ICE or as we were discussing earlier, you can certainly run this entire project on your own box. So rather than go to HTTP ICE1.FAS, you're just going to go to HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8080, for instance, or 127.0.0.1, which is your loopback IP address. Project Spec elaborates on that. So what are the implications? What's the takeaway? One, 
HTTP is something already familiar to you, and it's what all of these web applications are sort of based upon, and we'll see some more useful features of it in a moment, but it's this notion of ports, and it's this provision of ports by TCP and UDP, for that matter, that allow you to run multiple services on a box, and that's something you will by necessity be doing on FAS ultimately. So what's the deal with cookies? So you can ignore the technical details here. This is pulled from the RFC, just to sort of remind you that there is some formal underpinnings of this notion of a cookie, um, how to set them and how to get them. Um, but maybe just more in layman's terms or developer's terms. What's a cookie? A string Okay, good. And I'll summarize again for the, the folks at home. So a cookie, and I'll you know, change the definition slightly, often is just a file that a web server puts on your computer. So if you use Internet Explorer and you go into the My Documents and Settings folder, dot, 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 you'll eventually find a folder called Cookies. And in there are a whole bunch of text files, which are usually named according to your username and then the website's URL that you visited and that put that cookie on your computer. You know, for a while back, there was a lot of fear about cookies and it's a bad thing, it's an invasion of your privacy, and in theory they can be used for malicious purposes, and if browsers have bugs they can be used for really malicious purposes, but for the most part they're a terribly useful thing. That um, I would go so far as to say almost any website you visit today uses cookies and puts one on your computer even frankly if the developer didn't really intend it, if but the server is just set up in a default way that gives your browser a cookie. Well, what are they used for? Well, in theory, you could store any type of information on the user's computer that you want. The email address they use to log in, their username, their password. Well, that might be useful if the user doesn't appreciate having to log into your website every time they visit. You can effectively tuck that information away in a cookie, and the way cookies are handled by browsers and web servers is that by default, if you visit foo.com, and your browser has a foo.com cookie stored on it from some previous interaction, by default, IE or Firefox or whatever, are supposed to automatically send that cookie with the request for foo.com's homepage. And this is all transparent to you, but assuming you've left cookies enabled, all of that state, so to speak, gets transferred transparently back and forth thereby allowing the web server to remember that you've been there before and maybe what your username was or, f stupidly, what your password was. That's sort of a poor use of cookies. But the point is that you can tuck anything away. What people will often do is exactly that. Remember the user's email address and just tuck that away in a cookie. It's not particularly a violation of privacy, though you don't have to, but it's certainly a little more reasonable than storing a password. And this would allow you to pull up foo.com and have the login screen pre-populated with your email address. And then you can just type your password and save a step. But even more common, perhaps, is to store even less than something like an email address or a login name on the computer, but just, as you were suggesting, to store some kind of string often just a big random number effectively. Now why might that be useful? Well if you, the web server, tuck on the com into the computer of anyone that visits you just a big, ra big random but unique number and you remember yourself on the server side that the person who has big number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 happened to be named David Malin well, you can remember all that same information in your own database on the server, so long as the user's browser is just providing you with that key with every request made to your web server. So cookies, then, are very useful for maintaining what are known as sessions. So if you've ever visited a website, and you probably have, that somehow seems to be remembering information about you, even after the little globe is done spinning and you've effectively terminated your socket with the web server, Think Amazon.com. Have you ever added something to your shopping cart, sort of taken a step back, realized that page is loaded, you could even pull the plug from your internet connection, plug it back in, and then check out. And the information would still be remembered. Well, why is that? Well, Amazon has simply put on your computer, most likely, a big random number, and they've remembered that the owner of random number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, has uh, this book in his shopping cart, and so it knows on the server side what to show you when you go to check out. And we'll be using exactly this feature to implement things like your portal. So your portal remembers who it is that's logged in and what news feeds they want to see. And Project 4 will be using this so that you can remember what items the user has added to his or her 
shopping cart so that you can actually check the user out. And you can tuck anything away these days in these sessions, including, for instance, Java objects. So it will ultimately be up to you and say Project 4 to decide what does it mean to store something in a shopping cart? Well, you could just store an entire book object, or you could just store the book's ISBN number as a string. It'll ultimately be up to you. And it ultimately becomes a question of resources. How much memory, how much RAM or disk space do you want to be using on the server for each of the users that are maintaining an active session? And the cool thing about cookies in general is that via a fairly nice API, you can specify that this cookie is to last only for the duration of the user's browser window being open, which means as soon as they click close, that random number is thrown away. It's stored in RAM instead of on disk. Or you can say, you know what, this cookie, for their convenience, should stick around for seven days. So after seven days, I'm going to forget who they are, but for the next seven days, I will remember. So you can have that kind of granular control over the life of these cookies. And it's a really neat mechanism that these, again, are the technical details as to what it means to be a cookie in terms of a, a grammar almost. But for you, the developer, you're simply going to have this mechanism at your disposal just by way of some simple method calls. And we'll see that tonight. Yeah? Are you going to be storing any of this information in anything other than RAM? For Project 3, no. Um, you can choose to use persistent cookies. We will only be using session-based cookies, which means for the life of the browser, which means they'll end up in virtual mem memory on disk, potentially. They could be temporarily stored on disk in the temporary items folder. depends on the browser. But in spirit, they'll be completely ephemeral and will go away. Oh, I see. Will you be interacting with a database and files and such on the server? Um, Short answer is no. You can configure Tomcat to use disk space to store its sessions so that it doesn't need to all stay in RAM. But by design, nothing will be meant to be stored on the server. And certainly, if you're developing on your own client, that's fine, because Tomcat will be running on your server, so you can maintain state there as well. OK. Um, questions? before we sort of demonstrate some of these inner workings. And you can stare at me with bored looks if you are already experts at HTTP and sessions, and I will speed things up. So this was meant to be um, a demo. This will be perhaps a demo in the future when we migrate toward web services. So this is a screenshot of a neat little tool that comes with a toolkit called Axis. Axis is also from Apache, and we'll be using it in Project 4 and beyond to autom it's kind of cool, to automatically generate what are called stubs and skeletons. That is, actual Java code based only on what's called a WSDL file, an XML file that describes a service but doesn't actually implement it. So long story short, you will be automatically generating code for, for instance, Amazon's web service API without Amazon even needing to write any of the code. They're just going to describe with XML markup what kind of code you should use to interact with them. It's actually a really powerful thing. Um, I found something better, I think, something simpler than this demo. This demo essentially allows you to interpose a proxy server between you, your browser, and a web server so that we can monitor everything going back and forth. Turns out that some folks have done a really nice job implementing the same idea as a Firefox module, which is just a lot easier to deploy. So what I went ahead and did right before class, if you you'd like to play with this yourself, is I googled, I think, uh, Firefox HTTP headers. And the very first hit on Mozilla Dev Live HTTP headers is just a neat little module you can download. Once you do, you'll have the ability under View, Sidebar, to pull up Live HTTP headers. And for our purposes tonight, what this is going to allow us to see is not only the web pages we're pulling up, but also some of the hidden stuff that's going back and forth between web server and web browser, which for a typical user, not interesting and not useful. But for a developer, even one who's just debugging his or her application, terribly useful, because you can actually see what's being hidden from you by the browser. So we'll pull that up tonight. Just Google again, uh, Firefox HTTP headers. They did a really nice job providing this for you for free. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the demos. And when incidentally, just to be clear, when we started uh, Project 3 earlier, there was all of this initialization information, most of which you can just ignore unless it says warning or error, anything other than just info. But notice, too, that I'm using the console as sort of a debugging console. So you'll use that, too, in the project, you know, normally using print line, not the best approach. And you can certainly use more advanced techniques like uh, logging mechanisms, log4j, and so forth. But 
for the simpler approach for the project's development, we're just using some print line statements just to print things to the console here. And so all of these debugging messages or sort of in, in, uh, informational messages were generated when I logged in or tried to log in and when I clicked those buttons on Wahoo's main page. So your messages can go here as well just to sort of guide you through the process. But hitting control C will kill Wahoo, which means that port has now been released back to the operating system for someone else to use. And we're back at our prompt here. So I'm going to go into tonight's examples 7 directory. And among the files in here are the following. One, we've got a base directory, and we'll come back to that. That's sort of a really small um, and representative Tomcat uh, application that we'll come back to. And then I've got this Diag server application and get.html and post.html and some HTTP CGI that are really quick and dirty demos that sort of highlight exactly what will be going on in your own implementations, but certainly in a more fun form, the Wahoo stuff. So with that said, let me go ahead and on my local machine, just make sure we have get.html and post.html. And what I'm going to do on the server here, notice again we're on ICE 3, but you can do this on your own machines called localhost, or you could do it on any of the nice boxes. I'm going to open up diagserver.java. Funny thing about Java is that if you want to write a web server in Java, you can do it in like 30 lines of code. And you just pretty much instantiate a web server in Java given how many libraries exist. But this is effectively a web server. So it's called Diag Server. It happens to extend something that Sun provides called Network Server. And just with a few lines of code here, have I, do I ultimately attach to a specified port on the current box? And I just listen for HTTP requests. And any request I receive, this program is designed just to echo it to the console, just so we can see in a very simple demo exactly what's going on. So don't worry about the implementation of this, but just take it on faith, perhaps, that what this tool does is it simply acts as an echoing web server. It doesn't return any information, prints it to the console. So I'm going to run Diag Server on, let's say, port 8080, since I'm no longer using it. Diag Server started on port 8080. Nothing's happening. But what I'm going to do now is go over to get and post.html. And I'm going to go ahead and open up, let's say, uh, no, that's not going to be useful. Let's open this up with, let's open another terminal window. We'll get our syntax highlighting. Okay, so I am going to open get.html first. Very simple web page, um, but it illustrates pretty much all of the form mechanisms that you might want to employ for project three. Again, we're for the most part going to assume that you're familiar with HTML forms. If you're not, by all means, ask questions of me or the listserv, or frankly, again, spend an hour just Googling around, picking up any HTML book, and you'll know what features come with HTML forms. But we effectively have here a basic form that notice is going to submit to this URL, which I actually need to change, because randomly I've been assigned to ICE3, not ICE1. So I'm going to change that just by changing that to ICE3, though behind the scenes I'm actually going to change it on my local browser's copy. Well, that's the worst possible HTML editor to open. Let's, uh, I don't even know what that is. So let's close that. Let's just open it with WordPad, which will deal with the uh, carriage returns more nicely. Okay, so I'm going to change this over here to ICE3, back to the pretty printed version. So notice a couple things. One, the method I'm using is get. And if you want to be XHTML uh, compliant, even though get, the keyword, is in all caps, the attribute should be in all lowercase here. Notice that here I have a representative example of a text field that I called foo. Here we have a representative example of a radio button, which can take on two values, either 0 or 1. And notice with radio buttons, these are these mutually exclusive ones, right? If you click one of them, the other one's uncheck. And if you click one of the others, the one you just check, unchecked. Um, so what you do to enforce that sort of dependency is you just give them the same name, bar and bar, but different values. That's how radio buttons work if you've never used them. Checkboxes you're familiar with, I'm sure, in terms of usage. Just give it a name and specify a type of checkbox. By default, it will be unchecked. Uh, Quux here is an example of a select menu, which is, in this case, a single select. This is one of these drop-down menus that can apparently have two values, 0 or 1. Again, terribly simple examples just to get the usage across. And then here we have a text area. This is where you would fill in you know, multiple lines. And then finally, a submit button. Type submit. And then here is just the label 
that appears on the button. So no magic, pretty simple. And that is, for the most part, all that you might want to do with forms. And you can do a couple other things. You can have multiple select things, a couple more attributes to bear in mind. But for the most part, they're pretty straightforward. So with that said, why is this useful? So what I'm going to do is, now that I've changed this to ICE3, I'm going to go ahead and actually open this web page, which will look completely underwhelming, but it is a form. And notice that by construction, when I click Submit, where is this content going to get submitted to? So ICE3, and specifically port 8080. Well, normally that would be a dead end, but recall a moment ago, we spawned our little quick and dirty web server, which is still listening on port 8080. So in fact, even though the file for our demo purposes is on my local computer, frankly, we could have put it anywhere, it's going to submit to the server, and that's what's interesting. So if I go to my form and I say foo is going to have the name of, say, David, and bar is going to have a value of 1, I'm going to go ahead and check a baz. I'm going to chain quux to 1, and then I'm going to write hello world here, and I click submit. Nothing's going to happen in the browser because we don't have a full-fledged web server. All we have is this echoing server, but notice what came through. Again, all this Diag server does is it prints what was just sent to it by the web browser. So it's actually kind of cool. It turns out that when you just click submit, whether it's on Yahoo or Google or any site that has these submit buttons, the sort of stuff that's submitted by your browser is literally this kind of thing. Now this is called an HTTP GET request for the single reason that what the request ultimately contains is this top line here. So GET slash, and that denotes the root of the web server, it looks like a question mark precedes all of the parameters. So if you've never seen this before, the way that form inputs are submitted is by way of usually this uh, uh, parameter equals value pairs. And you separate each of these pairs with an ampersand. And just a uh, uh, brief warning, ampersands, recall, are sort of a dangerous character in XML. So odds are some percentage of you will experience a slight headache when it comes to escaping things like ampersands in URLs that are in web pages that are meant to be parsed by an XML parser. So keep that in mind if you get some weird errors. But in short, notice the browser's done all that encoding. And it looks like it encoded hello as uh, the comma in hello is sort of a special uh, URL entity of sorts. You can do this in most programming languages. And then it just specified at far right what version of HTTP to use. And it's pretty much 1.0 or 1.1 these days. Well, what's all this other stuff? For the most part, not interesting to you, the developer, unless you're sort of the, the sysadmin who's also trying to fine tune the server. But what browsers also tend to proactively inform web servers of is what kinds of files they're willing to accept. Hey, I support JPEGs. I support GIFs and pings. I support gzipped content or Microsoft applications, right? Not all browsers probably proactively say I support Microsoft documents, but this one does down there. And then start out star just means and anything else you might want to throw at me, for better or for worse. So that's just telling the web server what kind of content can be returned. For the most part, it doesn't matter, but it is useful if you're trying to distinguish what content to deliver based on mobile device versus web browser. That's where those MIME types can actually be useful. Uh, the language stuff is used or not used. The CPU may be used, but most of this is sent sort of optionally by the browser. Uh, this is sort of interesting, if you've never known this before. Browsers increasingly today support gzipping, transparent gzipping of content sent both by browser and by server, which is wonderful because, one, CPU speeds, for the most part, are faster than network speeds these days. And even if they aren't, you still tend to get an overall net benefit. So what's often happening with web servers today that send large web pages is they're quickly zipping up the content, sending it to your browser. Your browser's unzipping it and then showing it to you so long as you have, for instance, mod gzip installed on an Apache web server or something equivalent on IIS. So it's a neat thing, but this is something that the sysadmin would set up, but just set up once. It's transparent to the developers. Tells the, bra the server what user agent it is, so I'm using IE7 for that, or something compatible with IE7 in that request. Uh, the host that we specified, and then connection keep alive, and this is so that uh, back in the day, browsers would send one open a socket connection for every JPEG, every GIF, every HTML file downloaded just for one web page. It's rather inefficient to, and, uh, to induce, incur all that overhead. So this just means, hey, I can grab multiple things at once. So what is most useful to you, the developer, henceforth, is probably, for now, 
just that get line, since it shows all of the inputs that were provided. And fortunately, most programming languages, including PHP and JSP and servlets, sort of uh, unmarshal that information, as they might say, which means it takes that ugly string and sort of packages it up for you as an array, maybe, a hash table, maybe, some kinds of objects, typically. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel just to get that, that data. If, by contrast, I pull up my other file, which was called post.html, notice that this file is almost identical, except I changed one key attribute, method equals post. Okay? Why would one use post instead of get? Okay, so that there's, um, there's, there's a privacy implications. Anytime you use a get, that string ends up in the URL, which for better or for worse means it's likely to be persistent once the user steps away from that computer, especially in a lab environment. It means the user can bookmark that URL, which may or may not be a good thing if it sort of induces unexpected behavior. Why else might you want to use post instead of get? tends to be, or there's sort of a max length on the get string. So according to the RFC, there, in theory, shouldn't be a limit. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of browsers do impose a limit. I think IE at in one point was uh, 1,000, maybe 2,000 characters or so. So really, the rule of thumb, I would say, is if it's starting to get too long, it's time for post. But I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a hard, fast limit. But typically, you would use get for you know, fairly small requests. Think Google Maps, right? Google Maps is kind of pushes the limits of how long a URL probably should be. If you've ever emailed someone a Google Maps URL, they just start to get long. Um, post sends the same information, but it sends it in a slightly different fashion. It doesn't send it, so far as the browser is concerned, via the URL, but rather it sends a similar request and I'll send that same exact request, this time using post.html. I'm just going to adjust the host name to be ice3. So I'm going to go ahead and say David again. I'm going to choose one, check this, choose one, and say hello world. And I'm going to submit the post again to our Diag server. Notice now that we had our get up there, our newest request here, since the server is just listening in a loop. So notice that this changes. We're posting it to what? The root of the web server. So whatever's listening in the root directory is who's going to receive this. Notice that all this stuff is the same for the most part. Notice that the browser does tell the server how much content to expect so that it knows when the connection effectively is done, if it's persistent. And now you see pretty much the same string down here. But now, because you sort of are putting the content at the end of the request and specifying this sort of uh, hint as to how much content there is, this now allows you to encode an arbitrary amount of data. So if you've ever uploaded a file to YouTube or Flickr, right, that's probably a few hundred kilobytes, maybe even megabytes. All that stuff just gets encoded with some scheme down here. But the function is exactly the same, and the destination is exactly as it was before. So when to choose post over get if, one, you want to sort of hide the parameters from the user, not in a security sense, but just sort of in a utility sense, because at the end of the day, all of this information is just being transmitted publicly. So you don't really gain a huge amount of security just by using post. But really, if you've just got a lot of content or you've got binary content that you might want to upload to the server. So with that said, how does this become useful if you're just getting back these strings? Well, this file here, http.cgi, for those of you familiar with CGI or Perl, is just sort of a quick and dirty demo that sort of takes the idea of Diag server one step further and doesn't just echo the request, but it actually parses the request into a sort of scheme that's more useful for a developer. So what this thing now is going to do is the following. I went ahead and put this into my own public directory, since on FAS you can run CGI programs. So the URL this happens to be at now, though you can put this into your own account if you wish, I believe is in people.fas slash mailin http.cgi. Okay. And it hasn't done anything. But what it illustrates is the following. It turns out that if you use HTTP get, all those parameters that get submitted get uh, appended after a question mark. If you ever see a question mark in a URL, that is where file name effectively ends or path ends and parameters start. 
So with that said, if I do something simple like foo equals bar and then hit enter, it turns out what this program is doing for me, this CGI, is just echoing back those same parameters. But if I go ahead now and manually say, you know what, all right, baz is going to equal quux, now you see the additional string. So this is sort of a baby step, and we're not in this course focusing on CGI, but just to give you a sense, certainly of the sort of cross-platform um, nature of this content, but that all that's being submitted to the server are these very simple, albeit encoded, strings. And that'll become hopefully useful knowledge when it comes to actually debugging your own implementation. So let's actually use this content now. Now I'm going to actually go into this base directory where we actually have a, a Tomcat uh, distribution ready for us. Um, just to put this into context, you'll be downloading Tomcat, most of you probably, by choice, onto your own computers. Tomcat, again, is both a web server and application server, which means it serves up static content and dynamic content. Um, you typically could just drop your web applications into some directory of Tomcat itself, but one of the nice things about Tomcat is that it's really nicely designed in terms of uh, modularization, so that you can really just have Tomcat in one part of your web server, or laptop, and then you can actually put your application somewhere else entirely different. For us, this is wonderful because on nights we can install Tomcat once and all of you can just reference it by way of environment variables, and on your own machines you can do the same, which makes maintaining things and updating things so much nicer. There's not this inherent meshing of the two together. So effectively what I have here in my base directory are the files that comprise a web application. Tomcat itself is located elsewhere that by way of environment variables the command Tomcat will know how to find. So if I go ahead in here and open up this server.xml file, notice that I previously and arbitrarily chose the same port in 8.005, which assuming no one else is jumping ahead and using these same ports, should be available to us. At this point, I'll give you a quick tour of what else is in here, because this is really a simplified version of Project 3. In this conf directory is a file called Tomcat Users, just sort of has to be there. Don't confuse this with users.xml, which you'll see in, is part of project three and is our own file. This, for the most part, just exists as this empty file to keep Tomcat happy. More interesting is web.xml. And this is something we configured both for this lecture and for uh, project three. And it's in web.xml. And you can have multiple web.xml files, it turns out, in your application. This is where you do things like map URLs to actual classes that implement whatever program is running at that URL. This too is where you would specify what MIME types you want to accept and how you want to handle those. So just a teaser here, one in this file we have, and this is a copy paste from the Tomcat distribution, a default servlet, and it's this default servlet that essentially handles static content by default and provides directory listings when you just pull up a directory in Tomcat. Down here we actually have the JSP servlet. So it turns out, and we'll be playing with this in the latter half of tonight, when you have things like JSPs, which are like ASPs or CGI files or PHP files, well those are executed in effect by a servlet. And this, these lines here essentially just tell Tomcat who should handle .jsp files. And down below we have the following. And again, you, this is sort of learned by example. Tomcat does tend to provide some comments, and I tried to comment these as well. But here we have the following. If you visit slash on this web server, it's the default servlet that's going to handle things for any content there. If, by contrast, you visit any file ending in .jsp, that's going to be routed to the JSP servlet, which was defined higher up. So there's this notion of not only servlet definitions, but servlet mappings. And notice that by way of star, you don't have to, for instance, hard code some mention of every damn class that you implement. You can do things much more easily. We're just keeping it simple here. You can configure sessions to specify by default how long a session should survive. Maybe 30 minutes, 60 minutes, zero indicates that it should just last as long as the browser window is open effectively. And then MIME types, which are kind of boring, but I included the most common ones, certainly ones you might use for the project. And that's about it. And this, too, is one of those things that certainly as you start with Tomcat on your own, particularly after the course, you can just take these things out of the box. And that's literally what I did. I took Tomcat's default config files and really just stripped out stuff that we just didn't need. And that might be a potential distraction initially. That's it for the conf directory. In the temp directory, 
is nothing. It needs to be there to keep Tomcat happy because it wants some place to keep its temporary files while running. Work directory, similarly, this is, gets automatically created when Tomcat runs and just keeps a lot of temporary files. And web apps is where the interesting stuff is. So in this root directory is effectively the root of my application. And I chose fairly conventional names for directories and such so that you'd, they'd be familiar to you in the future. We've seen this before. For the particularly attentive, you might recall that in our conf directory, at the very bottom was this mentioned here of where the document base is for this application, and I specifically said look in root, which is by definition in the web apps directory for any requests of this server. That's where the real content begins. This is like the www root directory or htdocs directory for those of you familiar with Apache. You can actually specify that here. Some of these might be fun or interesting to change. For instance, reloadable um, is, I believe this flag indicates that if you ch recompile a class file, Tomcat should recognize the change in modification time and just use the new class file instead of requiring that you control C, shut down the whole server and reboot it, which is wonderful for, for development when it works to have it just notice that you've changed something. And then some other details which are not so interesting for now. But it's in this root directory that we finally have some examples of servlets and JSP. So what I think we can do is demo these quickly and then what we'll do in the latter half is sort of tease apart what JSPs and servlets are in general and where we're going with this. So I'm going to go ahead and run Tomcat from within this base directory. Tomcat assumes that when you just run it, the base directory you'll see in project 3 is going to be set up by an environment variable to be dot, which just means look here for all the configuration files and such. All this you've seen before. Notice that Catalina Home is on nice. That's where we put it. That directory path will look different on your own laptop or such. Um, JRE Home is where we put it on nice as well. So all that's been configured for you and will be for you on your own laptops and desktops as well if you follow the directions. And finally, we have the following. So I am still on, it seems, ICE 3 with Tomcat. So I'm going to go to HTTP, ICE 3, FAS, harvard.edu, colon 8080, enter, and here we are. So sort of a semi-familiar directory listing that you might see on any web server, but realize this is my web server. This isn't FAS's, this is one I'm literally running now, which means, especially if you get forgetful after a while, if I go ahead to this terminal, quit Tomcat, go back to my browser, go back to my browser and reload, perhaps needless to say, it's not going to reload since the server is no longer running, but it's easy to forget such details late at night as you're working on your projects. Now it should come through, there it is, it's back. So this again is the default root directory where the number of files are. Happy env is a file that we give you really to help you test your environment. Does this output look vaguely familiar? So this is like that environment check program, right? A lot of output, most of which you can ignore, but we had you check for the Xerxes version and the Zalin version and just presumably the manifestation of no errors is a good thing. Back here though, let's pull up our first JSP. You now know JSPs, right? Your first JSP is but hello world. If I actually view the source of this thing, completely uninteresting, it's just HTML which maybe this is a complete sham and all I've done is hard code that, but it does turn out that what's actually going on on the server, just to give you the teaser, is this. And this will be considered our first JSP. It's a one-liner, but JSPs, if you're familiar with PHP and ASPs and even CGI, they're this sort of potentially dangerous intermingling of actual aesthetic content presentation and actual logic. Those servlets and JSPs do a much better job sort of conceptually in teasing the two apart as we'll ultimately see. Certainly then do ASPs and CGIs and PHPs. But effectively all we have here is obviously sort of some embedded Java code in what ultimately just looks like an HTML file. And very similar in spirit to what you were doing with XSLT. If it's not an XSLT instruction it was assumed to just be a node that should be outputted raw. Here is sort of the opposite. It's going to be assumed to be HTML unless you have content in between 
open bracket, uh, percent sign, and percent sign close bracket, anything in there, in effect, is Java code. And you don't quite say system.out.println, you just say out dot print or out dot print line if you want to put content there. But for the most part, and the beautiful thing, especially if you're already a, you know, a happy Java programmer, is that JSP is allow you simply to integrate your Java code into this context of um, HTML output. And it's not necessarily the best approach because to intermingle the two very quickly becomes unmaintainable and a bit sloppy. And it's actually with servlets that we'll be able to factor out a lot of the Java code and leave a lot of the presentation, the last mile, so to speak, to these JSPs. More fun, though, than these simple JSPs are the servlets that are in here. So our teaser for that will be as follows. In the webinf slash classes directory, turns out there's three classes that I whipped up. So uh, visits.java, parameters.java, hello.java, and then the respective class files. Let's take a quick look at, let's say, uh, parameters. So parameters.java looks like this. It's just a few lines. Rather than tease this apart just yet, what I'm going to do is go back to the browser and go to, just because I memorized it in advance, servlet slash parameters, enter. Nothing seems to happen. So nothing seems to have happened yet. So what if I go question mark foo equals bar? Okay, somewhat familiar, but slightly more interesting than before in that Baz is going to equal Quux now. What I'm now doing isn't just displaying the raw string, which at the end of the day, not so useful. Now, because we actually have a web server in place, an application server in place, there appears to be some parsing of these variables going on such that I'm now displaying them still in simple form but with these colons and new lines which suggest that they've actually been unmarshaled and taken from this one long string into some kind of object maybe or array or list. We'll come back to actually how that's done. The other demo though I'll turn your attention to is let's say we had two others here parameters, view, visit and hello. Hello let's just to take it on faith that it's going to be saying hello to you and conclude the demo with visits. So visits unfortunately gives me this error. All right, let's tease this apart. Familiar looking error though in Tomcat's aesthetic scheme. All right, so we have some kind of servlet exception, missing user parameter, line 33 of visits.java. So it turns out, and that's an error message I wrote, and you can see it on the console as well. Tomcat reported the error there as well. Right, This is not good for the user. User should probably see some prettier error message, but what it's asking for is a user parameter. So if I want to give it a parameter called user, how do I have to change the URL? Slash question mark? Just question mark. We don't need the slash because there's no directories here. That Recall, how, why is this servlet slash visits? It's because in that web.xml file, you might recall that I did those servlet mappings and there was another web.xml file, which I didn't show you, I was about to tell the wrong story, that actually specifies what class handles URLs of that form. And it does not end in the slash, but it is just question mark, user equals, let's say Malin, enter. And now we seem to have a little message. Hey Malin, what's it been, zero times? Well, it turns out, if I refresh, as you might guess, it appears to be counting up. So what this is a very quick and dirty example of the use of cookies and in turn sessions. And it turns out if I close this window, let me copy the URL, I'm going to close the window, now I'm going to open it back up, it appears to have restarted. So it's not a persistent cookie, it's just probably loitering in RAM, so it didn't have any explicit expiration set other than the lifetime of the browser window. But if I keep reloading, this thing's going to be counting up. The only thing Tomcat is storing, though, in memory on my computer is just some big key, a unique identifier. And we'll tease apart after the break exactly the code that's maintaining this remembrance of who I am and how many times I've actually been. So why don't we go ahead and take our five-minute break. <laughs>
All right, we're back. So just so we have a simpler starting point, here is Hello World implemented in a servlet. Okay, how do you go about implementing this as a servlet? Just so that we see a very simple framework. So this is a file called hello.java. Well, why is it that slash servlet slash hello maps to hello.java? Well, notice as well in the directory called web.inf, and this too is sort of a conventional naming scheme for Tomcat, there's another web.xml file, which is sort of particular to all the files in here. And this is where, again, we see this idea of servlets being defined and mappings being defined. So essentially, and you can do this with a, a broader stroke using star and just the path to all these files, but I hard-coded it just so that we could see sort of a simple example. Here's a servlet that I just arbitrarily decided to call hello, and it's going to map to the class called capital hello. Same thing for parameters and visits. The mappings is where we deal with the URLs. So I sort of arbitrarily said that all servlets will be in slash servlet, which is not a real directory. This is sort of a virtual directory, sort of a faux directory based on URL only, that says that if you visit slash servlet slash hello, you're going to be mapped to the servlet called hello, which in turn means go use the class called capital hello. So that's all that's going on, and that's all that's in this particular file. Then you'll see something similar in project three's files. So in hello.java, we have, dare say, the simplest of servlets. So up top, I've imported some of the relevant files using star just to abstract away some of the details. Notice that what I've done is I've extended HTTP servlet. So think back to project one when you tended to extend default handler just because it was such an easier starting point than inventing, uh, implementing everything yourself. Same thing here. For the most part, when you implement a servlet, you can just start by extending the one Sun already implemented and override the methods that you actually care about. One of the most useful, of course, is the do get method, which, perhaps needless to say, handles gets. And then there's a do post. And we'll see us slightly, uh, you'll see us use these as well in project three. So how does this thing work? Well, notice the signature takes the method takes two parameters, a HTTP servlet request object and an HTTP servlet response object. It's in the request, as you might imagine, that all of the parameters are ultimately going to be tucked away. And it's in the response that we can tuck things like cookies that we want to send back to the client's browser and similar things. Sort of a, this is sort of your abstraction to the idea of an HTTP request and response that we looked at slightly more technically earlier um, tonight. So here, we're setting the MIME type of the response, because the servlet could return anything. We could return binary data. We could return an XML file. With this simple example, I just want to return HTML, albeit in sort of a nasty way down below. The simple example. This is just my, this is sort of a typical way to just get at what's the equivalent of system.out. But if you want to write to the browser, to the socket connection effectively, well, you just get the response objects writer and call it whatever you want, but just know that it's of type print writer. And then here, I'm just writing with a bunch of print lines what's effectively a web page. Right? Not the best way to do this, certainly, but certainly gets us to our hello world example. And that's it. That's the servlet. So the class returns precisely this content by printing to that writer, which in turn is mapped to the response object, and it's the whole servlet container that deals with the now getting that information to the user's browser. A non-HTTP servlet? Um, I've not had reason to use it myself. In theory, servlets need not be bound to HTTP. You could run them over other transport mechanisms like UDP if reliability is not as important. So I would hypothesize it's simply to allow for alternative transport um, transfer protocols, but I'm not sure from personal experience. I'll take a look now out of curiosity. In fact, a good, a good thing to point out now is that the API that should now be your friend as well is the following. I'm going to pull up the course's website. And under resources, which is perhaps an area you've been playing with of late, at least for project one, notice that there's this other API up top, which should start being as useful, perhaps, as some of the others. This is the API for Java servlet. So recall that in lecture one, I said that ultimately we'll be using J2EE in this course, but we're not going to be downloading the J2EE 
implementation per se from Sun. Rather, we're going to take the smaller distribution, the J2SE distribution, and then we're just going to add to it the jars from J2EE that we want. So what you're effectively doing for Project 3 and for this lecture in downloading Tomcat is you're downloading the servlet and JSP uh, subset of J2EE and integrating it into your Java distribution by way of class path settings and so forth. So Tomcat comes with the implementation of the API. So this is the Java doc for just Java X servlet and Java X servlet.http. So what we should see here are two of the things we just saw. One was a couple of the things, uh, HTTP servlet, and then we had the servlet request and a servlet response. So a servlet just to glance at that, but for the most part you can infer by example how these things work. Notice we have a little summary of some of these methods. Do get, do post, put and delete, rarely used, at least um, in the types of applications you see on the web today. Init and destroy are just sort of set up and destruction routines and then some info. So for the most part you've seen, albeit briefly in the hello example, one of the most useful methods that comes with this servlet that you would be thereby overriding yourself. Let's take a quick look at the response object. And if we scroll down here, among its methods are things like the ability to add a header. So if you're familiar with HTTP headers, if you want to deal with uh, browser caching and preventing it, you can add certain HTTP headers. Uh, you can encode URLs with these helper routines so that things are escaped effectively in a nice way. And we should see as well um, included down here is the uh, get writer routine, which is presumably inherited from something else since it's not here in the main list. Um, send redirect if you want to bounce the user somewhere else, just like returning a 301 HTTP re redirect. But again, for the most part, though the Java doc is helpful, you should see in these examples certainly the starting points that you might need. Well, what does parameters do? So parameters also extends the HTTP servlet, sort of nice, right? Fits within eight or so lines of code. Uh, same signature, it's a do get, but we could have implemented this as a do post, but because I wasn't submitting anything to it, sort of by nature, anytime you just pull up a web page, you're using get. So get is not just used for forms, it's used for any request that you might just type a URL or click on a link. So I'm going to return text plain this time, which is the MIME type for just ASCII text. I'm going to get the writer, and now notice, how do you get the parameters that were submitted to a servlet? Just call get parameter names. And what you get back is in Java enumeration of all of the names. So maybe it was, in my case it was foo and uh, baz were the parameter names. Now I can simply iterate over this enumeration. And this is just Java syntax, nothing particular to servlets here. I'm going to go ahead and get the first parameter by calling next element. By calling request.getParameter, specifying its name. So it's sort of a lookup table of sorts that you have access to. And what does that then do? Well, then I just printed it, recall. Printed the name, colon, value. Simple as that. If you want to just get at the variables that the user has submitted. Well, what about this final example, which somehow incorporated sessions? Well, notice that I explicitly stated what we were including this time, just to get across the fact that we were using, for instance, HTTP session. So that's all sort of provided to you for free, so long as you include it and then use it as follows. So I'm going to set the content type as plain, just because I didn't want to, I didn't care about user interface, just wanted to print the results for our purposes. Get the writer. Here I'm going to get specifically the parameter user. Now why did it fail the first time? Well, it was actually I who threw that servlet exception just to illustrate some error handling. Not graceful, necessarily, because the user saw the message too, but here's how we could terminate the execution of a servlet. And that was the instructive error message we saw. So how do you get a session? Using a session in servlets and JSPs is literally as easy as just assuming one exists and getting it. And henceforth tucking anything in it that you want. And that's the beauty of using infrastructures like uh, some, some of the provisions of PHP and ASP. CGI less so, you have to reinvent more of that typically unless you use certain libraries, but servlets and JSPs in particular really just hand you a really nice environment to work in. So I'm going to get the session, I'm just going to call it sesh, and now what am I going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is as following. I'm going to call get attribute on session, and an attribute is just like the key that I stored in the session. You can effectively store key value pairs. So I'm going to get the attribute, 
that is called user. Well, what's user? That was, recall the user's name. So effectively, this line is assuming that previously I stored in the session a key value pair using the last guy's username as the key. And just thinking ahead, what I stored as the value was what? The number of times this guy's been there. And this will make more sense once we get to the bottom of this. But for now, I'm sort of just assuming that in the session already is some value associated with the key that is the guy's username, which in my case was Malin. So I'm casting that to an integer, because what you store in the session typically are just objects. So it's sort of left to you to do the casting if necessary, at least if you're using um, sort of Java 1.4 syntax and so forth. I'm going to store it in something called visits. And now I'm just going to check. If it's null, the implication is what? It wasn't in the session, which probably means that Malin has never been here before, or he just opened a new browser window. So what I'm going to do myself is create a new integer initializing it to the value 0. And why this and not int? Well, again, I'm pushing an object into the session, not a primitive. So I'm going to store that here. What am I then going to do? Well, I'm going to call session.set attribute using the key that's my username, whatever I typed in. And then a new integer whose value is the current value plus 1. So a lot of this is just Java syntax, if, especially if you're not so familiar with the um, capital integer and so forth, but all we're doing is storing in the session an attribute value pair where the attribute is called malin in my case, and the value is however many times I visited already plus one. What are we then doing? We are simply printing to out, hey, username, what's it been? Then I grab that int value again, just grabbing the primitive value, times, question mark, and that's it. Simple example, only stores an int, but using precisely the same approach, could you just tuck away using maybe a user's email address or ID number? You could put a whole object in there called shopping cart that somehow, however you implement it, stores a user's shopping cart. And the details of how it's stored and where it's stored are entirely abstracted away for you. It's just you know that if you ask for the same key subsequently, it will be retrieved for you. And what this allows you then to do is to maintain state using HTTP, which sort of by nature is stateless. But using this cookie mechanism, do you have the maintenance of state? And when I say it's sort of by nature stately, it's, it's because when you request a web page, it comes back, that's it. right? The globe stops spinning. Your network connection doesn't even need to be alive anymore. But somehow you want to maintain some kind of communication between the two. All right. So just doubling, uh, jumping back in this directory, recall that in web apps and in root, we had hello1, hello2. In hello2, which we didn't glance at, was just another syntax just so that you know it exists. right? So ultimately, there is this sort of uh, well-formedness that you get with JSPs if you want it. Uh, so if you really want, what you're really writing when you say open bracket percent sign is you're writing a scriptlet like a tiny little script using a fragment of Java code. Well, if you really want to be explicit, you can actually do this, which sort of uses the idea of namespaces with which you're increasingly familiar and explicitly says this is a scriptlet. You never really see this used. It's not necessary, but it's sort of there, if nothing else, for com um, completeness. If you really want to be crazy, in xml.jsp, you can actually have Let's see, this is a demo taken from an earlier distribution of Tomcat that effectively integrates. Um, <laughs> this is sort of like creating uh, XML elements and attributes using the more verbose syntax that we saw in XSLT. Similarly, can you output things like explicit text, ensuring that it's going to be effectively a text node, although in the context of a JSP. So I offer this, and I pulled this from an older version of Tomcat, just to show you yet another approach, but I would wager, or I would put forth, a, or qualify this with a less common approach. But just realize there are different variations on syntax. Hello1, as you'll see with future examples, is by far, I think, the most common and the most sensible in terms of saving you time. OK. so where to go. So why don't we, one, let's try to put now what were ultimately demos there into sort of a larger context and then conclude by revisiting project three and then sort of letting you
uh, on, you, on your way to tackle the same. So what we're trying to take a step toward with Project 3 and also Project 4 is sort of a, a, basic, a, very re a basic but very representative, dare say, standard approach to implementing a web application. You know, smaller, something that we can bite off within the course of just three weeks, but something that sort of scales conceptually. So, and by this, I mean we're sort of trying to take the approach of having, and this is a, you know, sort of an unnecessarily histrionic buzz phrase, end-tier enterprise application. Well, really, that just means that you're trying to separate out as best you can a lot of the logical components of your application. The database is sort of conceptually separate. The web, uh, web server front end can be separate from the application server, which can be something else entirely different. Among other things, this allows you to sort of keep different components distinct technologically, it allows you to plug in a different application server if you decide, you know what, the one we're using really isn't up to snuff, we're going to have to replace it, say, with Oracle's latest application server. For the most part, you can sort of move these modules around if you design things in this very modularized way. Two, you can also, via tricks like DNS and other sorts of hardware and software solutions, you can scale more effectively if you have your web, your front end made up of not just one necessarily, but multiple web servers. If you've factored those out, it makes it much easier to scale. So there are a number of reasons where it's sort of sensible to sort of approach the design and implementation of applications in this modular way. And we begin to take steps toward that even with Wahoo. If you wanted to say, if you want to take the simplest scenario, coming back to our representative picture before, sure, we can toss the buzzword on this that this is a two-tier web application, where the two tiers just happen to be the client tier, and that's the HTML, and maybe the JavaScript, and the CSS running on the client, and then there's all the stuff on the server, which might just include all the email functionality, the database, the web server, the application server, probably fine for a lot of applications and a lot of purposes, but we can slap this label on it, certainly, as a two-tier application. Well, what might be the next sort of reasonable step, and dare say not uncommon step, would be to factor out one of those services. If your site sends out lots of emails for some reason, it might be sensible to take the load off the web server from doing that every 10 minutes or every hour and just factor that out to something that's independent. So here's a simple example of what we can now slap slightly different labels on. Here's the same client tier. The middle tier is really just your front end that talks with the client but also implements all of your logic. But anything that involves just sending mail or databases, for instance, can be factored out to what we could call the back end, which is one step removed then from the user and not a direct interface to them. You can take this one step further. A not an uncommon approach would be to still have your client side but then have this web server front end with one or more web servers serving up requests as they come in. An application server which actually has your code, like the business logic so to speak. Email server which might do whatever is appropriate with the emails and then the database server. And certainly you could draw the arrows differently here but this again just sort of is a one mental model for scaling these things and factoring out sort of unique functionality. So what's the relevance here? So we sort of hinted at this in the first lecture as to what XML's original, um, original vision was for, and one of them was for client-side rendering, right? Let IE, let Netscape render the content, let's just send the client the XML and not worry so much on the server side how to format things properly for a browser. Well, you know that this hasn't been so common, even you in project two, sort of did all of your generation of XHTML by way of XSLT first, yes on the client, but we're going to start doing that now on the server side, where you frankly just have more control over it. And we'll see in a diagram in just a moment, you can actually fit, if it feels appropriate, XML into any sort of of these tiers. Like it can have its uses in each of these tiers, um, depending on your goals and what task you want to achieve. Um, Client, so this is sort of a recap of what we um, hinted at in, I think, our first lecture. Okay, in the middle tier. So recall that the middle tier just tends to generally refer to any of the, lo the logic, your actual code, the implementation of your actual application. So XML can be used there, and you'll see how we use it, for instance, in Project 3. But just realize, and this too is the, the um, reminder that we've seen in previous lectures, a lot of what XML offers has long been in existence in other forms. So COM and DCOM have long allowed you to, for instance, um, marshal up 
objects and sort of give the illusion that code executing in one place can actually execute in another place. We'll revisit this issue when we talk about web services. But among the issues certainly historically have been you get then tied in sometimes to certain platforms. Some of these implementations of these ideas are proprietary in some sense. So just realize that, again, among the values of XML has often just been its openness and the fact that other people are just increasingly using it, which, for better or for worse, does have value. But it's simply a new approach to um, problems that have long existed and have long had solutions as well. Um, content aggregation. So if any of you use RSS, and this certainly is all the rage, it's hard to, fi not, it's hard to find a news-oriented website these days that doesn't have an RSS feed, I mean, that's sort of what RSS has been all about, aggregating content and delivering it simply in a more portable format. So this was a picture I think we saw in our first or second lecture as well. Why would you use XML in the middle tier? Again, with tying different applications and, and so forth together, well, it allows you just to speak some common format, if nothing else. And you don't need to worry about writing customized hooks just to get your databases to talk to your accounting system or whatever. Um, and the back end. So we will use XML, certainly in projects three and four, as sort of um, quick and dirty databases. Right? At the end of the day, an XML file, even like an Xtube and my Blockbuster, they're effectively little databases. Not the wisest storage mechanism for large data sets, certainly. But for reasonable sizes, it certainly works as well. But just realize as well that we'll see certain uses of XML in the back end, be it for configuration files, for storing of data persistently, or a couple of other uses that we'll see, again, when we get to web services. So just to put a picture around this and to give you a sense of how this relates to something like Wahoo, know that this might be said to be a typical, though not necessarily absolute, depiction of a, a J2EE architecture and using the same nomenclature, where you might call this front end the client tier, where you have your laptops, desktops, PDAs, and whatnot, the presentation layer is where you really have your web servers. And this is where you would have your implementations of um, JSPs and servlets. If you really wanted to factor things out and have more of your logic in sort of even more modular forms, if you're familiar with Java um, EJBs, beans, and so forth, where you can take the idea of factoring logic out one step further, you can have your data tier. And again, you can slap different labels on these things. But again, this sort of speaks to how you can begin to sort of lay out increasingly complex applications and peppering this particular depiction is XML question mark, XML question mark, because it can certainly be used in a number of these spots, either for good or for ill. And among the sort of questions that will be asked implicitly or explicitly on the projects is, does it really make sense to use it in some of these locations, right? It's one thing to talk about XML and think it's the solution to all of your problems in some form or other, but it doesn't always make sense. So we'll see some of the trade-offs over time. Um, we flipped things on their head tonight and did a number of the demos first, and these were simply meant to be the formal definitions of JSPs and servlets, which I'll defer to a, uh, an at-home exercise if you're curious as to how the spec defines JSPs and servlets, but those are excerpts there. We took a look already at Hello World, um, but I did promise to mention this list. So we'll be using Tomcat, one, because it is quite popular, it is very well maintained, it is um, fairly scalable and um, very, ro it is both scalable and re robust to this day, but it does fit into a collection of other options, many of them commercial, which at the end of the day should in spirit be able to do exactly the same thing, maybe with some distinctions as to scalability and such and as to what other features they offer, but at the end of the day these are all examples of J2EE containers, servlet containers, that implement, among other things perhaps, the J2EE spec for servlets and JSPs. And a couple of these might look familiar to you as well. But among the few that you can download for free are, for instance, the one we're using, Tomcat. Um, so just to summarize what goes on when you're actually using a servlet to sort of confirm what you saw in action. So. And I will read part of this just so that it's precise, even though it, um, it's not meant to be just a recitation. So typical means of accessing a servlet, obviously you have a browser. Step one, request some web page of a server. Step two, what happens? The web server receives that request and then effectively hands that request if it realizes it's not for static content. It's not for a GIF, it's not for an HTML file, it's for something dynamic, it hands it off to 
the servlet container, which in the case of Tomcat is sort of one and the same, but more specifically it's a servlet within the container that's being delegated responsibility for execution of what was just executed. And as we say here in the second sentence, the servlet container could be on the same box, it could be elsewhere. In the case of Tomcat, they're sort of one and the same, but you could certainly integrate, for instance, a J2EE container into, say, Apache, if you'd rather have Apache serving up your static content. Realize that for the most part, you're not tying yourself to one particular platform just because it happens to offer both such features. Three, the servlet container determines what servlet to invoke by way of configuration. Okay, what configuration in the sense of con Tomcat are we referring to? Yeah, web.xml in the more concrete sense. The servlet that is ultimately chosen or appropriate uses the request object, and you saw that, parameter number one to the do get routine, for instance, to figure out who the remote user is, what parameters might have been passed, and so forth. The servlet executes whatever logic is appropriate, and you saw three examples, hello, parameters, and visits, all of which had their own logic. It then sends the response that it generates back via the response object. And then finally, once the servlet is done, the servlet container is going to ensure that the response is serialized back to the client by way of the web front end, which in Tomcat, for the most part, is, for all intents and purposes, is one and the same. So that's a typical transaction. And so think now, as you're working on project three, if you're sort of in doubt as to how everything fits together, anytime you click a link on Wahoo, ultimately, these sequence of five steps, this sequence of five steps is what's going to be executed effectively. Slightly different as you integrate JSPs, but for the most part, it's that same idea. And in fact, it is the same idea because the JSPs are effectively executed by a servlet, as you saw from the other configuration file. Sessions, we looked at. It's a word on synchronization, because this is something that will come up by way of your implementing project three. So, there, as soon as you start implementing server-side software with, whom, with which multiple users can interact, you potentially run into problems of um, consistency of data, race conditions. If two entities are trying to access the same variable at once, uh, think of a canonical example. Well, let's, the, what this is hinting at is the following example. And the lesson here, if you're not so familiar with writing multi-threaded software, is what issues you at least have to bear in mind. And fortunately, Java does make resolution of these issues easier than a lot of other languages. So consider the following real world example as this hints at. So you are back in college and you have a roommate and you both have a refrigerator in your dorm room. And you come home alone to find that, damn, you're out of milk in the refrigerator. Because you open the door, no milk, and you realize I should go to the store and get milk. So you close the door, you head out, walk out the door, and you go to the store. Problem ensues. R roommate comes home. He too realizes, oh, no milk. I should go to the store. Closes the refrigerator, heads out the door, goes to the store. The problem ultimately is that you then end up with two quarts of milk. Okay, this, silly as it is, is sort of representative of a very common problem in multi-threaded applications, where in this scenario, the two roommates were threads, operating independently, but effectively executing the same code, trying to access or update the same resource. So think of the fridge then as a variable, its value was zero, both of you at different points in time, overlapping points in time, checked the value of this variable, found that it was zero, and realized, oops, I better go update this variable. But unfortunately, the result, because you didn't think to inform your roommate that, hey, I'm going to the store, is that either you're going to end up with count equals two in the end, which probably is not the intended goal, or in more of a computer sense, you might somehow end up with a value of one, but two things of milk in the fridge. Right? The analogy doesn't quite translate perfectly there. But for instance, if you update it to one and your roommate updates it to one, but there's somehow two things of milk in there. Right? So conceptually, intuitively, that's the sort of problems that can arise. So in the real world, how do you solve this problem? Leave a note. Right, leave a note. Right? Effectively lock the refrigerator by putting a piece of tape over it, putting a post-it note on it that says, hey, I've gone for milk. And the same exact idea exists in multi-threaded programming, where you lock the resource that you're trying to protect or that you want sole access to for some hopefully short period of time. So in Java, 
if you have the scenario in implementing Wahoo in particular where you have some global variable or some instance variable, and I'll leave it to you to determine exactly where this issue might arise, but you have some kind of state in your server that might be not only examined by multiple visitors, maybe sitting on different web browsers, but even those visitors might try to change the information. Think to yourself, how do I ensure that those guys are not going to both try to access that resource at once, but rather they're going to get serialized. One guy can access it, do whatever he wants with it, and once he's gone, then the next guy can come in. And quite simply, the way Java solves this problem or offers a solution to this problem is with the synchronized keyword. So I believe we have at least one, ex we do have an example of this in the Wahoo code. Um, in the Wahoo code, for instance, as we'll conclude with tonight, is a user, manual, user manager. So you probably, you may have inferred from our Wahoo login that there, you saw that there was the register button. Well, the register button, long story short, allows you to create a new username with a new password, and then that information gets saved to an, H, an XML file, which effectively is our user's database. So let's apply the lesson there. So suppose that I'm sitting at my laptop and someone else is sitting at their laptop pulling up my very impressive implementation of Wahoo. And we both decide I'm going to register for this really cool website. So we both type our username and passwords, choices thereof, and click register roughly at the same time. Well, think about the back end. How do you update the XML file? Well, you probably have to read it into memory then add an element to it, a new user element, and then write it back out. So suppose that it just so happens because of our proximity and time, both of us sit down, click register, which means the servlet running in the web, running in the servlet container, both threads that are handling our requests, grab the XML file, read it into memory, into RAM. Each of those threads running the same code, but with different, in different memory spaces effectively, update the XML fragment by adding another user element or another DOM node. So now this version of the code has Malin as the new username. This version of the XML has Bob as the new username. Then his happens to get written first, and then mine gets written. What just happened? We overwrote Bob's registration, which means Bob was just informed, presumably, your account has been created, but his data just got clobbered because we simultaneously or near simultaneously were trying to update the same resource, which in this case was an XML file, but could just as reasonably be an object in memory if you were just caching registrations in memory and writing them out to disk later. So how do you ensure that Bob's information goes in first, then my thread reads that information and then writes out the new information? Well, you synchronize access to these dangerous resources or these potentially dangerous resources. And effectively in Java, it's as simple as saying with a keyword in front of your method signature, this method should be synchronized. And what that effectively means is that even if multiple threads, which is a very common case in web servers, are executing the same code, only one thread will be able to act, run this method at once. Literally, the other guys will be put to sleep temporarily until the guy in that method gets out, that is, returns then the next guy goes in. Yeah? Good question. Can you synchronize multiple methods? The way that, I believe, the way that Java implements synchronization is that it actually s synchronizes on the whole object. So effectively, even though you're just saying synchronize on a per method basis, you're actually locking access to everything about the object. And I would have to check if this is the, the same in Java 1.5, but effectively you get that behavior. So as long as you have your delete user, create user. You could just say both are synchronized and it has the same effect. So bear it in mind, and this is the sort of thing where it's very easy to write buggy code in for this application and not even realize it's buggy. Because unless you have your family and friends all trying to use your application at once, you're not likely to see this bug because you yourself are probably not likely to debug your application by very quickly clicking on two different browsers simultaneously on two different computers. But you have to appreciate conceptually and certainly when you start deploying applications to real people and not just yourself that this is a very serious problem to consider. And also you want to consider the, of course, the
uh, efficiency of the efficiency implication. You could certainly just in your main method or in do get effectively just lock the heck out of your code. Say this whole damn thing is going to be synchronized. I only want one person executing this code at once. But obviously that's sort of a foolish approach because now it means out of all the modules in your code, depending on how you do this, now you're saying that only one person can use my website at once, and that's probably not the goal. And so one of the uh, the lessons you want to keep in mind when synchronizing code is typically to synchronize as little code as possible. So any method, think of this as the rule of thumb, any method you synchronize should be as short as possible, if only for performance reasons. But realize too there are implications if you're synchronizing other methods in the same class, in the same object. Okay, so project three. So we began with project three, we'll conclude with project three. So. This is just a silly introduction to what you've already seen, which is that Project 3 is all about content syndication. We're going to be using a news provider called Moreover. Moreover.com has a whole bunch of news feeds. The usage thereof and access thereof is documented in the project. But effectively, what you will be implementing for this project is sort of this architecture. And it sort of borrows from the same spirit of a typical, what we call typical J2EE architecture. Fortunately, you don't have to write all of it. We've given you a bit of framework and we've tried to keep it simple so that it's one, simultaneously useful and interesting and instructive, but also still leaves interesting aspects for you to implement. So in this architecture, we have, and again, this is sort of arbitrary how we label it, a client tier, a middle tier, and a back end tier. The user database I actually described a moment ago, and that was where I said our database is actually just an XML file. All right, it doesn't scale terribly well, but certainly for our first pass at a web app, perfectly good solution, especially when we're trying to sort of acquaint you even more with all things XML. So this is the servlet user manager that ultimately implements or interacts with this database, but this is just a file called users.xml. We have a news provider class, which uh, already sort of handles the process of contacting moreover, grabbing a news feed, and returning it to you as XML. We sort of took care of those details just to get some of the boring stuff out of the way. And then all of the stuff that you'll be playing with for the most part is in this, excuse me, middle tier and executing in the container. So we did implement the login servlet, which gets the user to either register or log in, but then we hit that blank page. And the page you hit specifically was this. That blank page was the view servlet which as the name suggests is where the user should be able to view his or her subscriptions to these various news feeds. The prep servlet, also blank page, this is where the user should be able to subscribe to and unsubscribe from certain feeds and also ultimately customize his or her interface based on whatever your quote unquote personal touch is that you add to project three. Um, you write specifically these two, although you're certainly allowed to dabble per the spec in some of the other areas as well. But what ultimately you'll have is really a full-fledged web applications that, in theory, you can have your friends and family playing with or at least showing it off to them. And what you'll find, hopefully, is that you get a number of lessons, um, if, especially if you're not familiar with these things already, including the server-side experience, the use of sessions and cookies and so forth. Certainly, servlets, which is where we'll spend more of our time. We'll use uh, JSPs a little bit more in Project 4. But it, I will say, as you think ahead to your project pre-proposals, that a number of the students every semester do tend to use this kind of architecture or at least a server-side application as the context for their final projects. And so what you can think of these frameworks also as are useful starting points for your own projects ultimately to say, I'm going to take the idea of Wahoo, rip out a lot of the code that's specific to a web portal, but use the basic framework as the starting point for my project. So realize that this is there for you as well. Questions? Well, it's officially adjourned here, and we'll do section down the hall and do a code walkthrough for Project 3. See you next week.